Welcome to the 2023 11th United Designs Alliance Biennial Online and the third Messages to Humanity poster exhibition. I'm Robert Hauer, and it is an honor today as a member of UDA to introduce our organization and today's program. Welcome to all who are with us from early morning to midday and to late night participants. After my intro, we have a special group of presenters today. First, we'll have Albert Chue, the founder, president emeritus, and executive director of UDA, will speak and provide an overview and an introduction. Then keynote speaker, Bernd Reidel, the CEO of Ellery Studios in Berlin. After the keynote speaker, a message to humanity, poster and exhibition gallery talk by Robert Graham, Vice President of Design Technology at UDA. To end our event, we will have closing remarks from Sarah Meyer, UDA Vice President of Design Education. If you haven't already, please mute your mics and thank you very much for participating today. So now a few thoughts on our community. The UDA organization welcomes students, practitioners, and educators of all origins and identities as we work individually and collectively to respect, serve, and contribute to the many facets of society. UDA seeks to establish a comprehensive and UDA and supportive international network of communication design educators and practitioners. We are committed to adopting, collaborating, creating, impacting, and influencing creativity, intellectual, intellectual inquiry, and cultural engagement. As educators and professionals, we develop our partnerships to strengthen our profession. Of primary importance, we provide and share our creativity without prejudice against color, convention, economy, education, history, nationality, race, religion, sex, skill set, or social status. Past President Kelly Salchel MacArthur expressed in a recent UDA publication that she was proud to be part of the supportive global and conscientious community of designers that makes up the United Design Alliance. Kelly further mentions the annual document that we develop in December is an opportunity to communicate with our international peers through writing and design while recognizing the responsibility we hold as visual communicators for the public. Both, both messages resonate. The United Design Alliance messages in the annual publication introductions over the last few years have reflected the international health and political conditions that have impacted our daily lives. As designers, students, and educators, we are aware of the world's challenges. Enhanced UDA programming has helped us move successfully through these times with webinars, symposia, and numerous global opportunities to share new ideas and your creative work. Through the UDA experiences, we all are able to discover our position or purpose within the field of design. This discovery also supports a philosophy of lifelong learning and nurtures a resilient designer. By developing individual traits of resilience, our creative path will be more self-assured as we encounter life and career challenges. Personal relevancy in our field can be enhanced by doing work that matters to us. This includes the ability to have a meaningful and positive impact on society through the completion of that work. Developing a keen awareness of cultural anthropology research connects us on a human level to our work. As you know, cultural anthropologists study how people who share a common cultural system organize and shape the physical and social world around them, and are in turn shaped by those ideas, behaviors, and physical environments. For many of us, our work has evolved over the years towards an increasing cultural engagement with environmental and humanistic issues and action. The United Design Alliance contributes to your design experiences and growth. We look forward to continuing sharing ideas and design experiences in 2024. Thank you for listening to me and just uh, hearing this brief introduction. 
Now I'd like to first recognize and then introduce Albert Choi, the founder, the president emeritus and executive director of UDA. Some of you may know that Albert launched United Designs Alliance on April 20th, 2014 in Seoul, Korea, with a focus on its sustainable growth and development of the organization. Through his nurturing, United Designs Alliance is a global design organization seeking to build an international design and educational network to understand unique design work and exchange ideas on communication design practice, education, and culture. So I'd like to have you all welcome Albert. And again, thank you for your participation today. Oh, thank you, Robert. Uh, this is a good introduction uh, of UDA and the event. Uh, my name is Albert Choi, uh, as Robert mentioned. Thank you. Uh, welcome to our 11th United Designs of BNL. Today is our third Messages to Humanity poster exhibition. The message is always love and forgiveness. Every two years, with the United Designs Biennial, we celebrate our creativity and existence by promoting our messages. We must realize that only love and forgiveness will help us survive and nurture nature and humans. The action must come from our hearts and mind. It should be a permanent source for our efforts. So many people should reform or revert their attitudes and beliefs toward favoring others. Love is beautiful and so is a forgiveness. They work side by side. They came from our origin and we are born from the womb of love. We can recurrence the earth and ourselves. These beautiful posters will show our shared beliefs and where our origin is. It is lovely where we live and where our children will live. Thank you to all the participants globally for showing their beautiful message, messages from their origin and typographic designs. And also thank you to all our guests tonight or, to, or today or this morning, <laughs> wherever you are uh, uh, to this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's my short welcoming remark to you. Thank you. And I hope I can see you again uh, next time. Uh, it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Bern Riddell, or Riddell in, you know, American English accent, but Riddell, right? Uh, did I pronounce your last name right? Oh, I hope I do. Okay. <laughs> Bern is a head of strategy and design at L Larry, uh, Larry Studio, right? Larry Studio. Larry Studio is a Berlin-based creative, creative and strategy agency specialized in knowledge generation and transfer. So we call it transformation design. Awesome, a new approach. It's been uh, idealized 15 years ago uh, from UK. And now he is leading in Berlin and also in Europe. So today the keynote presentation, the title is uh, Putting the Brakes on Dystopia. Uh, this presentation will be a multimedia report from the field detailing Larry Studio's ongoing efforts to break down uh, climate policy and model desirable futures. Um, it's so much learn we can learn from him. So please give your warm welcome hands to Bern Riddell. Um, are you ready, Riddell? Uh, Bern? <laughs> okay, the screen is yours, Bern. Go okay, perfect. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I'll quickly have to start my presentation. Give me a second. Let's hope this works. Right. No, that's not it. Uh, just starting. So, 
now. Any second now. Okay. Do you see my presentation? Yes? yes. Okay, perfect. Great. Yes. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here and to share some of our work. And I thought because the title is Letters to Humanity, I picked in particular something that fits right into that. Um, it's a driving force that is very important for us and my team. Um, but I'll get into that in a second. I'm banned. Um, and in the next 20 minutes, I'll talk about dystopias, utopias, and how something called the solar punk mindset manifests in actual change projects within the German energy transition. So about myself, like uh, I was introduced already very nicely. I'm the founder and creative director of Ellery Studio. We are uh, based in Berlin. We are a transformation design agency and we're working predominantly in the fields of climate action, renewable energy, and social change. And we're mostly known for, info, uh, for our information design. So infographics is a huge part of the work that we do, but that's not what this talk is about today. So this is kind of the stuff that we do a lot. It's our bread and butter. But uh, what I want to talk about is change by design, not by disaster, because we are convinced that we can steer accelerate and drive change and that we should not wait for catastrophes to force us to act but take a personal stand on the question of what kind of future do we want to live in and then of course actively shape the steps toward it and that best of course together so we also follow this guiding principle in all our projects uh, we support our organizations in shaping sustainable transformation by providing low threshold access to relevant information, by collectively anticipating the future, and then by taking action. And as you can see, we also have a little Venn diagram. Of course, we are information designers about that. You see there's a lot of overlaps in between. Uh, it's a very blurry field. It's all and nothing. Uh, it's hard to grasp sometimes. But uh, let's take a look how this looks like. Like this is my team. Um, it consists of information designers, strategists, facilitators, and future foresight specialists. Funny enough, this is only half of the team. Uh, this was the last team photo we took before COVID. Um, since then, we doubled in size. So we are uh, about 22 people by now. But let's dive right into it. Part one of this talk, the future as a catastrophe. Things in the world are not uh, going that well. If you turn on the news uh, here, it's just symbolized by this pixelated dumpster fire. And dystopia, if you uh, take a look into pop culture, is having a cultural moment because of this. And as a society, we kind of became obsessed with dystopia in a way that's not productive. Like natural disasters gained a lot of traction in pop culture since even the 2000s. And nowadays, a little conversation like, how's the weather, can already lead into scary thoughts. The climate crisis is becoming increasingly real, like we notice it all around. It's October here in Germany, it is uh, screeching hot, it is 30 degrees. But we also seem um, confronted with that, increasingly paralyzed when it comes to acting. Uh, we kind of are on a treadmill of fear and dismay. And some of you might be saying, um, in Germany, it's not that bad. Isn't Germany doing quite okay -ish when it comes to climate action and renewable energy? Isn't life good there? And to some degree, that's also true, uh, especially when it comes to addressing climate change, where Germany has been a world leader for many decades already. Because starting in the 1990s, Germany began to frame its effort to tackle climate change as the Energiewende. That means energy transition. It's a move away from old polluting fossil powers towards renewable green energy. It is very much based in the anti-nuclear movement. So the suffix Wende, a German word, means turning point. And to give you an idea of how seriously Germans take this word, the only other time they use it in the language is to refer to 
the move to unify East and West Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1998, uh, 1989. So sadly, the excitement in the Energiewende uh, is lagging today. Public enthusiasm is drying up, goals aren't being met, and in fact, some of Germany's climate goals already were way too modest. They weren't up to the task of fixing our climate crisis and communication around that topic with the public isn't done in an uh, effective way, not at all. So dry ac academic and hard to parse content, uh, even for people who do this professionally. Another big issue when it comes to motivation, Germany's politicians no longer have a vision attached to the energy vendor. It's all doom and gloom. And here's a little quote by one of our former chancellors to illustrate that conservative mindset that's very dominant nowadays. We also have a huge industry pressure that derails climate change initiatives. So uh, as you can imagine, German's car industry is very dominant and they have a very strong lobby. So a uh, little service announcement, failed big ideas coming in. We, the world, but especially Berliners, uh, are haunted by the big ideas of the 20th century, which are national socialism and state communism. You could even say that Berlin is the graveyard of big ideas. Very important, big ideas, not great ideas. And there's an abundance of big ideas, uh, of progress and of modernity that ended up with an over-reliance on science uh, that was later debunked. Starting in the 50s and 60s, there was a giddy promise of new untested technologies and schemes. And this led to many of the nasty problems and lock-in effects we struggle with today. That uh, might be car-centered city layouts or industrial wastelands. We see some of uh, this embrace of risky ideas and technology repeated again today with the rise of geoengineering as a future alternative for climate change mitigation uh, through policy and preventive action. So it's tempting to let those big ideas take us right back to the dystopia. Better not have big ideas. In some ways, it's easier to surrender than to wallow. But, uh, I, and I think you'd agree, we shouldn't do that, of course. We can and we should put a face of optimism um, to see what could be possible when we collectively put our minds to it. And let's not forget, sometimes a different perspective already turns one person's dystopia, like here's no pizza, into a utopia for another person. That brings me to part two. Uh, rewriting the future with the help of utopian thinking. And what do I actually mean by utopia? Is it the island the philosopher Thomas More dreamed of already in 1516? He wrote a book called Utopia, um, and that set the baseline for utopian thinking. What he did, um, he located his desired ideas of a better world on an island which is geographically far away. Uh, the metaphor of an island was later adopted in many uh, further utopias and almost became a symbol for parallel realities. Just to visualize how long that ago that is, uh, that's Thomas Moore. Like this is prime medieval stuff. Later, when humanity discovered more and more parts of the planet, it became harder and harder to imagine that an island uh, how more described it would exist somewhere hidden away. And so utopian ideas moved from the geographical dimension to the temporal dimension, which means the authors found a place for the utopian ideas in the future. If you look at current definition, we identify with Liesmann's um, idea. Uh, that's an Austrian philosopher. This what could be done is something that triggers a completely new perspective on fiction and utopia. It's understanding them as a process. It's not only about creating a perfect but non-existent world. It's about creating and shaping a dream with the intention to change reality. We have to look at something called the future cone to understand that. 
Um, maybe you have seen that before. It's quite hip at the moment in future sciences. It categorizes probable, plausible, and preferable futures. It shows the plural, uh, plural, uh, plurality of futures, uh, each with different qualities. And of course, you won't find utopias in the realm of probable futures. Utopian ideas are outside of the future call. It looks a little something like that. Um, so in the, the sense of Liesmann's what could be done, we understand that uh, as intentional utopias. And intentional utopias we understand as a form of a membrane. It marks the transition uh, from the impossible to the possible. And like a membrane, it lets through ideas and dreams and visions that inform our today's decision-making. Utopias can provoke, inspire, and help to, help to explore new horizons. By taking dreams seriously, we can empower more people to transform our here and now, our reality, inspired by those shared dreams, and to take an active role in demanding and inventing better futures. So we set out to craft those futures. Because as Oscar Wilde said beautiful, beautifully, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not even worth glancing at. Uh, but of course, there's also a catch. Utopian thinking demands patience. Uh, it demands fearlessness, critical reflection, analytic rigor, um, optimism, and most of all, the actual will to take action. Contingency and uncertainty, the very things that often keep us from taking action, can be positive and foster creativity and potential. And the conditions of utopia can be shaped and changed, enabling a diversity of futures, increasing possibilities and junctions, um, which is not the case in dystopia, um, the future as a catastrophe. Utopian thinking can create excitement, which arises through images and stories, and they grow out of imagination. Imagination takes effect mainly in one genre, and that is, of course, science fiction. It is the demonstration of ideas that do not yet exist. One could say it's the showcase of the future. But the question is, in which direction are we looking into a future that is kind of shaped by ideas from Blade Runner? That's definitely not what we think is utopian. Um, we want utopias that inspire us and are role models for us. So we see this in something called solar punk. You might have heard of that before. This is part three of this talk, solar punk. I'll explain what it is. Well, um, the central point of solar punk is what does a sustainable civilization look like and how can we get there? So how does it look like? There's a handful of pre-AI era visualizations that were heavily influencing the first solar punkers. Like this one by artist Imperial Boy. You might have seen this before if you're very much into story punks and sustainability. This uh, guarded quite the moment, uh, this movement guarded quite the moment, momentum in the last like five, six, seven years. The premise of solar punk addresses both the technological capability and the collective imagination to create a new ecologically balanced world. It follows in the footsteps of the great story punks. Um, first and foremost, of course, cyberpunk. Uh, you might also know steampunk or diesel punk, atom punk. There's so many punks out there. And the uh, um, solar punk movement finally seems to catch up with those very popular story punks. And compared to cyberpunk, it's actually not that radical because most technologies and practices that it draws from already actually exist. The thing that is radical about it is that it seeks active societal change. 
and the emph emphasis is on imagining. The radical change we need is moving towards a fossil-free society. That's very much also what uh, my studio is aiming for. Uh, but the imagery that we have for the last decades that looks mostly like that. Um, this is not very inspiring. It's not captivating. And you might have seen this kind of image around in any presentation or publication when it's about visions for sustainable futures. But uh, the things that are important is levity and fun. Um, in our experience, that works much, much better. So it is up to us to create acceptance and buy-in for those topics. And solo punk provides a fantastic narrative framework for it because uh, it is perfect for speculation and imagination. That brings us to part fear of uh, part four. How could that look like applying solar punk as a design tool? I brought some small examples how we at Ellery Studio uh, apply the solar punk mindset and utopian thinking to play and explore and engage in our daily work with the energy transition. So first off, the challenge we usually face in our work is this. The focus for most policymakers in Germany traditionally is always acceptance of the transition to sustainable energy systems, like accepting that we have to make a sacrifice. Um, it's literally about saying, here's what our experts have found, now sell it to the general public. But we found it was far better to get people involved in the energy vendor, in the energy transition with an invitation to take part in it and with attraction. So the solar punk mindset is a fantastic tool that very uh, that guides us very much in that premise. Um, and uh, it's fertile grounds for participation. And um, one of my favorite buzzwords and um, talking points, collective imagination. So our first attempt to explore this potential uh, of the solar punk movement for the energy transition happened in 2018, because uh, after our first contact with this concept, um, it was still a niche topic limited to a few books and Tumblr posts, and there weren't many visuals out there at the time. And when we saw that there was basically no event or meetup around that topic yet, uh, as rapid prototypers at heart, we wanted to experiment with it and uh, assembled uh, climate enthusiasts from our network to form a coalition for exploration. Because uh, new exciting narratives are in super high demand when it's about moving towards a more just and more fair future for everyone. And um, that is also the case for the German energy transition community. So this is how we then um, prototyped the Solar Punk Festival, SPF 18, um, which took place in Berlin and in surroundings and in a two-week program We've brought together about 50 activists, energy professionals, scientists, artists, students uh, at the Technical University of Berlin. And we had about 150 visitors joining us um, at our certain workshops and closing show events. And together we thought about how desirable eco-balanced futures could look like. We have approached the subject through uh, scientific lectures. We got some really well-known future scientists to contribute. They were actually really eager to join in this uh, event. We used methods of design thinking and future studies. Together, we took the artists to travel to a former open pit mine where uh, the artists then painted a large mural there based on the concepts they learned from the exchange with the experts and the scientists. And while we painted, we were really lucky because in the background, it's a huge concert area, this open pit mine. And uh, we had an unexpected audience of 30,000 people because uh, just pure coincidence, one of Germany's most famous punk bands were playing in the background while we painted. So that was quite appropriate. The punk part was definitely covered. Then we had a series of public lectures in Berlin in collaboration with the meetup group Speculative Futures Berlin. I can also highly recommend that meetup. Uh, and finally, we had an incredible DIY installation that was exhibited. Uh, it was a 30 square meter sustainable solar punk living capsule. Let's have a look in the living room. 
Um, here we see some of the narrative objects that represented a variety of ideas about the futures. And the stories that were told through these objects uh, reach from interior to pets. Here's a 3D printing uh, gene modified spider, uh, to variables, to UI solutions like this interactive home control setup that uh, steers the sustainable uh, functions of your living capsule. And all of that was built during the festival all from recycled materials from the Technical University of Berlin stage design department who donated tons and tons of equipment and materials. Um, but the essential thing that we have created with the Solar Punk Festival is an environment, an interaction. So we designed a space to talk to each other. Um, we have opened up spaces of possibilities and allowed to ask the question of what if and that is solar punk as we understand it. It's playful, perhaps a bit naive, and it's all DIY, but it can create images and narratives that inspire. And if you want to see more of those results, the website is still online. Feel free to explore it at solarpunkfestival.com. And uh, I'll move on to another solar punky outreach project, very up to date. So it uh, started with Fridays for Futures in Berlin. Um, their movement was in full swing. We started a project uh, with a research grant about visualizing ideas of climate activists in a format we called the Future Booth. And uh, it works exactly like a photo booth at a wedding party. But in our booth, we would take a snapshot, not of the present, but a snapshot of the future. And in the beginning, of course, that took shape via graphic recording. So we had our team uh, of illustrators go live draw the ideas of those students, of those activists, uh, what are the desirable futures that they imagine. Um, they would instantly on location translate ideas in interview situations into visuals. And uh, the solar punk narrative gave us the framework for the conversation we had at the demos. We then also were invited a lot uh, to not only work with students, but also with scientists and politicians and talk with them about their utopias. Um, and as you can see, it's often not a thing that scientists and politicians are used to. Now, um, that at least creating those visuals got way easier with the advent of AI image generation. I assume most of you already have worked with Stable Diffusion or with Midjourney or any other AI that's out there, um, ChatGPT, of course, um, but we were focusing on the visual ones because um, last year, July, we moved on to visualize these visions of the activists and energy experts and policy makers um, with the help of AI. Um, now, we've been traveling uh, all of Europe from conference to conference and uh, visualize these ideas that these experts have. So we have 10 minute interviews with the participants uh, led by one of our future foresight specialists, while in parallel, our prompters do their thing based on these conversations. And then you get stuff like this, like very nice visuals. Many of them uh, result, uh, many of the results address uh, greener cities and biodiversity, or even radical new ways of housing, uh, a new sense of community, sustainable transportation is a really big thing, or inclusivity often comes up. Others imagine a more prominent integration of renewable energy. As you see, um, each of these images that I just skipped through really quickly because we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, but each of them have a backstory, a concept at heart, uh, and are connected to a specific person and their personal hopes and dreams. Like this one, for example, was from the ambassador of Tibet to Germany, who dreams of how Tibet could populate its glacial retreat areas. And just uh, a few days ago, I was in Vienna at a big city festival. We were invited by the Austrian government to uh, visualize the ideas and dreams and wishes and uh, desirable futures of the regular Austrian citizens in Vienna. Uh, here's a solar, solar um, powered beer garden, for example, 
or how could solar uh, look like if you want to use it in your garden? Then, of course, um, nice public spaces and urban gardening were a big a, a deal. And this one, one of my favorites, how does invisible public transportation look like? But uh, in the end, most of them actually were talking about a different kind of togetherness, looking at how divided the world is at the moment. And this was my personal favorite, uh, the sound of music with solar panels. If you want to check out more of these visions, you can take a look at this Flickr account where we collected many of the results. Um, worth, worth a look, there's like quite interesting things in there. Which brings me to another topic, to the last thing I want to show you. Uh, we also use utopian ideas in many of the science communication projects that we do. Like this, for example, it's a graphic novel about the transition to sustainable mobility. It's about a space dog and his family and their antics when it comes to cars and bikes and public transportation. We translate numbers and data into comprehensible stories uh, in the form of a comic strip to make the topic exciting and understandable, even for non-topic uh, non experts. And it features a ton of scientific background information. And everything you need to know about bikes, public transport, and other forms of mobility. But the most solar punk kind of scientific publication that we did so far is the Infographic Energy Transition Coloring Book. It's a book with 33 infographics that can be colored in, where you learn about the past, present, and future of renewable energy and climate action. Um, these books, uh, both of them, we have a bunch of more of them. You can check out our website. Um, these books were very successful. Um, several editions were published and uh, many of them won uh, quite a series of international design awards and grants. Um, and another proof of concept that these kind of design artifacts that um, teach, uh, deliver content is that uh, the coloring book is a publication that not only one, but actually two German chancellors have in their private book collection. So here's the thing. How often do you see a German head of state smile? Not that often. That's the, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, that brings me to the end. Uh, a quick summary. What's the takeaway? Uh, what we at Ellery Studio learned about applying this new way of thinking and uh, this, this kind of new approach to uh, the solar punk mindset, to utopian thinking, to this bringing minds together uh, and applying it in climate action. The use of utopias is a fruitful tool to open up spaces of possibility and to allow questions about the what if, what if we do this or that. Um, only in this way, we can create interest and enthusiasm for new things that we could not have imagined before. And back to the thesis of the talk, how do we put the brakes on our dystopian moment, on the uh, doom and gloom that it's so dominant, uh, especially after the last few years uh, that were so heavily influenced by the COVID pandemic? Um, we need to understand the current workings of our system in order to rework it. And visual media and exciting narratives can help us do this. We need to offer alternatives that have teeth and Solarpunk, for example, is a narrative framework that uh, does this. It's a future vision that puts something proactive out there, something that wants to create value. And finally, we need to make this a conversation that's intensely public and accessible to all. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. And I hand it back to Albert. Good. Um, well, you know, I'm not a mediator, so Bern, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. You hand it to me, so I, I hand it to uh, Robert Grain. Okay.
All right, can everybody see my screen? All right, thank you. Bernard, or Bernard Barnd, um, excellent talk. Thank you so much for that. Really refreshing um, and much needed. Um, so thanks, one thanks again for that. Um, I also wanna thank Robert Hauer and Albert Choi um, for their leadership. Um, and so greetings, everyone. My name is Robert Graham. I'm an Associate Professor of Design and Visual Communication at the University of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and I get the pleasure of um, sharing our work, our poster work. Um, and so I have a few brief statements and I'm gonna stop my camera so we can focus in on the work today, but um, I do have a few, a few brief statements to kind of talk through. So let me stop sharing my camera. So these, these brief statements are a really sort of um, important way to kind of set up today's talk. Our capacity for compassion is one of our greatest superpowers as designers. The United Designs Biennial Exhibition of Posters contains thoughts on how we might create a better, more harmonious world. And as such, the posters are a powerful collection of messages on love and forgiveness. And as you will see throughout, designers share their kindness with a good heart. Uh, and I think that's fundamental. Um, and this idea of, again, how we sort of create excitement as Byrne mentioned, I think is fundamental to what we do and what we can do as designers. The following message to humanity posters representing designers from 15 countries, organized or sequenced by geometry, movement, and of course their expression through typography. Um, and so one quick note before I get into kind of sharing the work today, I just wanted to apologize upfront for any names that I might accidentally mispronounce at this point. So this is our third message to humanity poster exhibition. And it's a wonderful range and an ongoing kind of narrative on the power of love and the presence of kindness. So our first poster comes by way of Daniela Marx. Um, and the quote that Daniela chose is from Martin Luther King. And it essentially um, conveys that people can find forgiveness and find a way to truly love one another through the equality, through equality, peace, and kindness. Um, and so we see that through the type of graphic expression, the colors that are being used. And this is a, a wonderful way to kind of kickstart um, the posters that were submitted as part of this um, activity. Next, we have Ivan Kashlakov. Um, and this one is interesting. It's the teachings of a Bulgarian philosopher named Peter Donnov. And essentially it's about the highway to love revolution. So each one of these kind of off ramps, if you will, are the um, teachings of this philosopher. Um, and so a really lovely metaphor in terms of how we might embrace this kind of highway. Um, and this, again, this idea of love as a revolution. Next, we have work by Lisa Graham. Each one of us is unique and distinct, but it takes connection of togetherness for love and forgiveness to function. We are all connected by our uniqueness. Um, and so the phraseology definitely kind of re references that and kind of bolsters that um, in terms of the kind of loveliness of those, uh, those words. Next, we have Wenbo Wei, Wei, excuse me. And this poster embodies the essence of heartfelt love and acceptance. Uh, so we can see this through the character of the letter forms, the personality that exists. Um, of course, the colors are being utilized throughout and the wonderful kind of expression of this idea of love as acceptance. Um, and I think that word acceptance came up in Bird's talk as well. Next up, we have Iris Wang. And so this one's based upon the Chinese character for love and essentially regarding love as everyone's destination and longing and encourages people to be brave and to express love. So wonderful sentiment. Next, we 
We have work by Jana Christofaro. And again, focusing on the word love, uh, love has the power to heal, to change, to cure, to calm, and of course, unite. Um, and so again, the significance of the, the sort of circles of the letter forms coming together um, kind of reinforce that um, in terms of the messaging. And, you know, again, thinking about our, our keynote today um, and the idea that we're at this sort of precipice, I think Jurgen's work um, sort of lovely, for, in a really lovely way frames that um, and the idea of fragility um, and what a spark can do. Um, and so we are losing not only love and forgiveness, but also respect and humility towards nature, which is something we all share. Through our actions, we're losing the balance in a wonderful but fragile network of nature. Um, and so what you see here is kind of the representation of that nature. And then furthermore, when it goes up in flames, we also go down with it. It is up to us. Uh, up next is Frerink uh, Kiss. Um, and this is, comes from a poem by Andre Adi. Um, and it's essentially regarding um, love as a means of humanity. Um, and so this comes from the time of World War II uh, when there was sort of this uh, really interesting, um, not, not interesting is not the right word, but a really sort of, um, oh, challenging time. Um, and so this idea of love means humanity, um, I think is beautifully reinforced within a statement and talking about the fact that you have to see it with your heart as well as your intellect. Um, and so something that kind of looks at, at the senses um, as well as again, how type um, reinforces that um, kind of connectedness. And then work we have, the next work is Ben Ami Ratinsky. And um, this one goes on to say, there are many aspects to love and forgiveness is one of them. And so the, the focus on that message, the, the clarity of that um, is something that comes through in a really kind of um, meaningful way. And then up next, we have Tommaso Marcola and essentially speaks to the fact that human rights are still not respected and it takes time and love and forgiveness for these rights to become universal. And then we have work by Albert, um, who's with us today. Um, and again, um, a wonderful, um, a sort of a wonderful um, person to kind of spearhead or organization um, and um, oversee its growth. Um, and we see in this work, um, the regard for in the end, there's no love or life without pain, like a beautiful flower that blooms after being shaken and soaked. Um, and so, you know, I think that we see this kind of commonality as we go through each one of these posters today um, and the kind of shared quality of our, our insight into love and forgiveness and what we would like to see in return. Next up is Chris Cornell, um, and it comes from a quote by the Beatles. Um, and so the relationship of the level of positive engagement, love has, has with humanity and corresponding love received in return. And so that's this kind of reciprocation or reciprocity and I mentioned just talking about Albert's work. Um, and then of course, how all the letter forms are linked, um, how all the words are linked um, tends, uh, has a tendency to kind of underscore that. And then we have uh, June Paik, um, when, and it's a great poem. So I'm gonna, I'm, kind of, I'm gonna kind of read it at this point. When spring comes after winter, like flowers bloom again, our lives also bloom again with love and forgiveness. So beautiful, um, and it is.
Next up, we have work by Ming Lian uh, Lian, um, Li. Um, and this one's based upon the Chinese character forgiveness. And it goes on to express the theme of love and forgiveness. Um, and so it's, it's powerful because the letter forms are powerful. Um, and the expression within it is powerful as well. And then we have Antonio Santos. And so uh, in this is the idea of nonviolent communication is based upon the premise of what matters is not what we say, but very much how we say it. And you can see the great heart there as well. Moving on, we have work by Hong Yun Ma. And this one references uh, the idea of in a world where love and compassion intertwine, we discover the beauty of embracing differences. Let's celebrate love's boundless power to bridge hearts and foster acceptance. Moving on, we have work here by Luis Rivera. This poster talks about how people descend to help other people with humanity and love. And so it's all about empathy. Um, and I think that, you know, I talked about compassion in terms of being a superpower as a designer and empathy is a, a really important extension of that and helps with how we look at design thinking activities. It's a kind of the fundamental Kickstarter or catalyst. Um, and so this poster sort of embraces that um, and in a way that becomes uh, really engaging. And, uh, you know, I think that also the, the motion that's in it also sort of amplifies that. And then next up, we have Pavel Peskatlakov. So let me say that last name one more time, Peskatlakov. Um, and I'm sure I didn't get that correct, but I apologize. But, um, you know, I think that um, this one is really interesting for the fact that it speaks to the fact that love is the driving force behind forgiveness. Love forgives everything as long as it is between two people. Um, and that quote comes from the movie Sky Airplane Girl. And then the next poster is by myself. Um, and so um, it's a great quote by Amanda Gorman. Um, and it's essentially to show the power of compassion as the most direct form of love. Up next, we have Andrzej Haskot. Um, and his poster is about presenting a Slavic uh, proverb, love teaches everything. And then from there, we'll go to the work of Guoyan Chen. Um, and this work is regarding the transformation of the Chinese character for love and transferring it into a shape that needs to be embraced or to be embraced represents the sublimation of love into the state of forgiveness, which is an expression of great love. And moving on to our next poster, uh, Kathiana Cordania. It's a phrase from Dr. Wahinta Kambit. Um, and so, you know, unlike maybe some of our philosophers or poets or songwriters or designers um, or otherwise, this phrase comes from somebody that discovered the vaccine uh, for leprosy and made really important discoveries about cancer, um, was nominated for a Nobel Prize. Um, and so uh, I think a really interesting and powerful statement um, based upon what sort of all disciplines can contribute to this idea of love and forgiveness. Next up, we have work by Lindau. Um, this poster is a love message for the young future generation who grew up, grew up on the internet and have another virtual presence in the digital world. Um, and so it's about care for sort of all our personas um, and again, kind of respect for that at the same time. Next up, we have work by Megan D who wanted to explore the words of bell hooks. 
um, and in doing so to create a sense of motion and feeling um, and, and we're kind of relaying um, bell hooks words. From there, we have work by Hyena Nam and essentially goes on to convey love heals, forgiveness sets you free, and it's a message about the transformative power of both love and forgiveness. And then we wrap up with the work today of Guang Tong Song. The poster aims to convey the confusion principles, confusion, the confusion principles of kindness and love. These principles encourage us to relate to others with kindness, love, and respect. And so I wanted to say thank you to each designer for your wonderful contributions um, and your thoughtful posters that um, were a part of this year's um, exhibition. Thanks you all. Thank you. That That's just amazing. I am so impressed. Yeah. Um, Definitely reactions of just beautiful <laughs> work, beautiful work. Um, so I think we're doing really well on time. And I just want to take a moment and um, say, I, I am so incredibly impressed. I am blown away. I, I don't even know where to begin with just how impress impressive the work is. So I'll start with myself. I'm Sarah Meyer. I am a professor of predominantly typography, visual communication design at Cal Poly Pomona in Southern California. And I am currently serving as executive director of design education with UDA. And I wanna thank Albert specifically for founding an organization that provides so much opportunity worldwide for discussion about the positive effects of design. His years of service and leadership and mentoring the future design community uh, cannot go unrecognized. Um, it's just, you know, with heart and passion, as you can see presented here, he leads us to do better through design. Um, I am happy to speak about how amazing the organization is for providing opportunities. Our mission and goals build an international design network for the exchange of ideas and the practice and culture for education. I'm particularly proud of its commitment for collaboration and for the ability to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I encourage all of you to look into uniteddesigns.org for further information. I'd like to take a moment to thank Robert Howard for your leadership, your um, you know, carrying on the baton throughout the years, to keep this organization moving forward. And I'd also like to thank specifically Bernard today, your discussion about the possibilities for design worldwide just have made my heart grow. Uh, I, you know, and so a couple of notes on this in particular that I would like to highlight and bring to everyone's attention. The concept of energy wind can be a counterbalance if approached with positivity. I think what was really apparent through this presentation is that the scarcity mindset, the fear-driven mentality about how we can control our future leads to folks disregarding measurable results, ignoring the merits of moving forward, and undermines a positive environment 
for creative solutions through toxicity and a lack of understanding that abundance is the only way to go forward. And that abundance is through honoring and respecting each other's skill sets, such as defined through this organization, our diversity of thought, and our ability to problem solve when all are brought to the table. So I truly believe that that presentation is just a spark for all the young minds in this room. It is a spark for me to continue on and to develop a future cone that makes anything plausible and possible that really hit home. And so I thank you for that excellent presentation that shows that not only are we as designers capable of aesthetics, but capable of problem solving that can change the world. And as stated from the very beginning, love only operates through the foundations of possibility and being open to opportunities. So thank you, you know, just a moment, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernard. I'd also like to follow up with a thank you to Robert Graham for just a really excellent discourse on the posters that were presented. It's a great representation of work from around the world expressed through typography and visual representation and illustration. But without your leadership, I would not have had the depth and breadth of understanding that you provided through your narrative. I believe that for all of us, you made the presentation enlightening and allowed for us to see the work through a translated eye, a gifted eye. I really appreciate your leadership. And to the students and colleagues and professional designers in this room that are up in the middle of the night and phoning in very early in the morning, thank you for your participation. It's amazing that we have so many people willing to stay up till th you know, 3, 2400, whatever clock that you use, and those that are willing to time come in from around the world, you know, really early in the morning. Your willingness, which comes from the heart, to participate proves to us that we can operate through abundance. I know we only have a, but a small handful of people that are in this organization, but it's a wonderful community. So I really appreciate your participation and I hope that you'll spread the word. I encourage all of you to go home and take what you saw as an opportunity to change how you work, to an opportunity to change how you think about design, how you think about the potential, as Bernard has said, as well as how you think about communicating in your own areas, in your own, you know, your hometown. That small change can redefine what might now be a toxic conversation into a conversation about abundance about opportunity. So I, with that, I encourage you to follow Bernard's Ellerly Studio and also check into the solarpunkfestival.com. Uh, I'm going right there. I wanna see more beautiful work. I also encourage you to follow UDA on YouTube, Instagram, and most importantly, through the website where you have access to a lot of this beautiful work that you've seen today and opportunities for you to present research, engage with the community of designers that you're meeting here, plus all those that are unable to be here today. 
It's a large and welcoming and positive community, I think you can see from the way this presentation has gone today. So please look forward to future webinars through our website and throughout the year, as well as opportunities to hear from designers about their current research and where they're going. So thank you. Thank you all. Greatly appreciate it.